Hello, my fellow readers. This is I, Dark Symphony 777 with another video. And this is a video I've been... That honestly is kind of spontaneous. So originally, I was supposed to do uh, my review of Headmaster Arc by Kaur Alaran. And as I was reading that story, I got very curious about the, the author as a whole because how could such a well-renowned author a well-respected author like have such really have such a bad store set of stories because fun fact headmaster arc i'm not recommending that story that story sucks And it's not even just Headmaster Arc. It was... This is something I've been curious about for a while. And I like to give... You know, authors and stories the benefit of the doubt. Like, I, I, like I'm trying... I try to be as fair as I possibly can. I'm not perfect. You know, there's always going to be... You know, there's going to be mistakes and stuff like that. That's always... That's just... That's just how it is. So, I got curious... And I looked on the author's profile page. And what I saw just made me lose... Not only made me lose all respect for the author, but honestly convinced me of the idea that Kower al Aran is probably the most overrated fan fiction author I've ever read, ever had to see. Like, it's, it's so astounding... How someone, an author that is seen as in such high regards, just completely what's the what's the term? Shoffen fraud. There it is. Compete in in a massive amount of shoffen fraud. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want you to get an understanding of how popular Core is. This is the Ruby page on fanfiction.net. I sorted it by how many reviews the sto each story has. So most reviews are first and then go down. In this page, out of the top 25 Ruby fanfictions, 20 of them are all written by Coer. Relic of the Future, Forge Destiny, White Shape, Not This Time Fate, Headmaster Arc, Rabbit Among Wolves, Service to a Smile, Professor Arc, Arc Corp, Self Made Man, uh, In Your Wildest Dreams, Ra, uh, Rays, Arc Royale, Night of Salem, Null, Beast of Beacon, Arcanum, In the, In the Kingdom Service, uh, Remnants, Blonde Bard, uh, and From Beyond. And all out of all of them, I read six of them. I, I read all of them, and I... Uh, I read Forge Destiny, probably the worst fan fiction I ever read, ever well ever reviewed on this channel, which is a tall order. That this is like among the worst. Not this time, Fate. Not this time, Fate is actually with Better Off Alone as one of my favorite fan fictions ever. Professor uh, Headmaster Arc didn't like it. Professor Arc was very was actually a very entertaining story. Night of Salem, which was completely art, which is honestly pretty garbage. And I've read actually read a little bit of from from beyond, and I thought eh, it's it's kinda alright from what I read. But this tells you how much in high regard Core is seen by the Ruby community. If you go to any Root, like any discussion on any YouTube channel, and they talk and talk about like Ruby, and someone brings up fan fiction. Sure enough, someone is going to refer is going to mention Coer somewhere in that conversation. It's that it's not a promise; it's a guarantee. And event, and it, it it's just a shame. I think. 
part part of the reason why I did I started to kind of get curious was actually a question that was given to me by a friend, uh, Starlet Duck. She asked me what was the worst fan fiction ever reviewed, and I was stuck with two choices. I was either stuck with Forged Destiny because the moment she asked that, my mind went straight to that because that is without a doubt the single worst fan fiction I ever read on this channel. Or two, uh, Dan versus everything because of all the stuff that happened behind the scenes with that story. That's a whole can of worms but that, that I'm not going to touch on. But in this case, I did talk about Dan versus everything because I honestly think that's slightly worse than Forge Destiny because of the background, the whole background situation behind it. No, before Destiny is a, it's a close second. Part of the reason why I didn't like Forge Destiny, and I'm not gonna dive into a big re-review of Forge Destiny. To put it simply, Forge Destiny is just an utter shit show. But the relevant part that I'm gonna use for this video is the shipping war between. Lancaster and Nightshade. Uh, Ruby has like actual ship names. Lancaster is Ruby and John. Nightshade is Blake and John. And where is it? Oh, where is it? Yeah, here it is. In the beginning of Forge Destiny, the author open admits the story is going to be Lancaster, which is Ruby and John. The author, then I would say around chapter 6, 7, abandons Ruby because he didn't like writing as her, uh, writing her, decided to make, change it to Nightshade. And you could tell the author really didn't like, didn't openly remove Lancaster. This caused a domino effect over the course of this entire story. Where people, I think, and I honestly think, this is a story where people kind of started realizing that Kor is very overrated. Because I think this is like his most divisive story ever. What happened is the Lancaster, uh, Lancaster ship fans found out about the fact that this is a night, that he just randomly made it Nightshade. And started harassing him. And this is actually this is actually something that it, he kind of implies in the author's note because he kind of he kind of really does go into like the background stuff in the author's note. So it's like any background information or like any real world situations that are happening to him, they're gonna be in the author's notes. And he implies that the Lancaster fans they really weren't happy with the decision. And this kind of carried on over the course of books one to four. And eventually came to a head where he got tired of the complaining and said, All right, we're gonna do we're gonna go back to Lancaster. The problem is he, he the author went about it in the worst way possible by turning Blake, who at the time at the time when I was reading through the story, the whole Blake John romance was the only part I really liked about the early chapters, because I thought, it's like, all right, that's, it's, it's not bad. What the author does is the author randomly makes Blake so monstrously out of character just to facilitate a breakup. He basically makes her a whiny, uh, a whiny, abusive, uh, self-indulgent asshole who's who is all? Who even the narration constantly says, "Oh, you're right about this," and, right, and then they break up just after like all this abuse and all this toxicity, just to facilitate Lancaster. And then the Nightshade fans get pissed because not only was their ship uh, completely abandoned in the worst way possible for favor of Lancaster, but the fact that. The author is now just being super, super submissive to his fans. So now they fight. 
Now both ships are fighting. Koer is caught in the middle because now he's trying to appease both ships. Eventually, he does a random, uh, supposedly does a random ass poll saying, okay, who do you want John to uh, stay with? That causes another ship war, and John ult- and Koer ultimately decides, I will give you both, and has it a three way relationship at the end between John, Blake, and Ruby. And then the shippers are completely pissed because he copped out of the whole thing. It has caused, I think, a domino effect over this whole capitulation of, of wanting to appease the fans no matter what. If you write, and I will say this, if you write for everyone, you ultimately write for no one. And now, now you're probably wondering... What is everything about Happen and Forge Destiny have to do with the whole point of me saying he's overrated? Well, if we go to his profile picture, this is his profile picture. I will say this before I continue on: don't harass the guy. He he is, you know, he's human. He's gonna make mistakes. This is more what I think of him as author no, more over than anything just don't just don't harass you go down to his goal as a writer here and it says and I quote to write consistently good stories showing improvements on each fic I don't want to be a one hit wonder something I was worried about when writing one good turn which is one of the two first stories he wrote wrote along with Professor Ark. Thankfully, I think I approved not to be with the release of Professor Ark, but I want to take it further, producing a third and even a fourth and more high-quality fix. This will become increasingly difficult, however, as I explore more adventurous pairings. So this is kind of the first thing that really catches your eye. He is very, very obsessed with Every one of his main stories having a John pairing. For whatever reason, every single story has to have a pairing. And that and that reaches the Nadir with Forge Destiny, because now you're dealing with the notoriously toxic shipping community that is the Ruby fan base. Ruby has I, I, I'm not even I'm not even high, being hyperbole that Ruby has one of the most toxic shipping communities in any fandom ever. I think the only shipping community that's like even more toxic would be like Sonic, I believe. The whole so- between Sonic Dow versus sh- sh- um, the whole uh, Sonami and Shadami whole thing. Maybe Avatar: The Last Airbender, Steven Universe as well. But Ruby, Br- Br- Ruby's up there. Ruby is massively up there. And it's just a clusterfuck of trying to force romance into stories where not every single one of them needed romance. So, in order from for the stories that I know that have that I know have shipping, I have not read every single one of these stories, but I know enough about most of them that I that I kind of know the whole Professor Arc thing. Uh, Professor Ark has him hook up with Glinda Goodwitch, and Headmaster Ark has him end up with a weird harem between Yang, Ruby, Neo, and Cinder for some odd reason. From from beyond uh, is a Nightshade, John and Blake. Stress relief is John and Cinder. Uh, not this time. Fate is John and Weiss. Beacon Snow War is implied Arctos. No, no. Uh, Pyra is just very thirsty in that story. Never mind. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Forge Destiny is John, Ruby, and Blake. Service of Smile apparently is John and one of the Malachite twins from the uh, 
from the yellow trailer. Uh, Night of Salem, John and Salem. And I think there's one more. Where was it? I'm trying to remember. I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to remember. There's one more. Um... No, I can't. No, I, I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember. I know there's one more that I could. I could remember. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah I can't remember. I can't. Oh yeah, I think it was this one, which I think was him and him and no, no, I can't remember. No, I can't remember. But going back, going back to this. He seems to have an obsession with trying to fit romance. Not every single story has romance. Civil Be uh, Beacon Civil War doesn't have romance. Captain Dragon doesn't have romance. Um, but every single story that focuses on John specifically, he seems to either hook up, either have a bunch of people lusting after him, or that usually ends up with like one person, I think. No, even Indiana, even Night of Salem kind of has that, where at the end he kind of has a threesome with Salem and Pyrrha, and Salem's like trying to throw the harm root on John, and he doesn't want it. But yeah. It's very dull and repetitive, and I always, and I always say this, not every story needs to have romance. Eventually, I hope to run through most of the female cast, I'm not a fan of Yuri Yaoi pairings, though hap can happily read them. My problem simply stems from a lot of them featuring unrealistic romance, i.e. characters only seem to fall in love because the author wants them to. You... That makes no sense, because that's the whole point of ship... That's the whole point of writing romance in fan fiction. It's like, oh, I want these two characters to ship. Because the author wants them to. You're not making a lot of sense on that. And then he has a facts uh, pay, uh, part of his story. And the one I want to highlight. Uh, let's see. First off is how much, how do you write so much and so often? And he says, hard work is the only answer here and there is no shortcuts. If you become more experienced and the only way to do this is to write a lot, you will start to write better first drafts. When you write better first drafts, you can write faster as I do. My stories are certainly not perfect and the simple reason for this is because I cannot go back and edit chapters. Often I have a single day to write, proof, publish a chapter for you all. In terms of how much I write, I have to make sacrifices. I don't watch TV. I don't use social media. I limit time playing games or such it requires discipline here is where it gets complicated with this question now Coer apparently works for slash runs a magazine in Britain I don't know what magazine he writes don't ask me don't ask me I simply don't know the problem with this mindset is he's equating trying to write as much as he can in a shorter time frame without going back and proofreading it. Why is that an issue? Well, the best way I can I can describe it is actually not this story. Where is it? Where is it? There it is, right here. Is not this time uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Arc Two. If we go to chapter 12, right here, in context of this story, in chapter 11, when, Col when John was describing the battle of Beacon, he reveals that uh, Mercury Black and Emerald Suturai was killed by a Raven. That is technically true, except they were killed by a Raven. In this story. And you can actually tell. And he actually explains it. 
Last chapter, I said that Raven killed Mercury Neville. She did, and not this time fate. But that was specifically because John went and removed Yang's one time save against Neo. Mean Raven, you know. Mercury was killed by Weiss, and and uh, Winter killed Emerald. He openly admitted that not to that is a mistake. Now, honestly, if this uh, if this uh, author's note didn't exist, I would say okay, fine. That is an understandable mistake because you know, in both Professor Arc One and Not This Time Fate, they do die. It's just a matter of who is the one who killed them. However, by mentioning specifically that he is going to not only putting attention on it, but also openly admit he's going to go back and change it. That puts a target on his sense of consistency. This is something I've noticed in a lot of his stories, even except for maybe not this time fate. This is much, this is actually uh, the big problem I had with uh, Headmaster Arc. Spoilers for that review. Uh, this story is massively inconsistent. There is so many inconsistencies that it's not even funny. Every time, as I went through the stories, I kept finding more inconsistencies on the plot, on the characters, on the setting, on the world. So many inconsistencies that it's it honestly detracts from the story. It actually take it actually takes me out of the story, and I actually started getting a headache. It actually caused me to take longer writing the stories because there was just so much. So many inconsistencies with the story. I'll talk more about that when I review this story. But this idea of writing fast without proofreading, it comes with a legitimate cost at the quality of your stories. Because if you write fast, you upload fast, you don't edit, you don't give the time to make sure everything is right. It's gonna. That's going to cause a backlash. Well, not a backlash. A feedback loop where you're unable to really make sense of what you're writing makes sense in the context of the story, which is why Headmaster Arc failed. Half the time, the story just stopped making any sense, and it was obvious the author just pumped out a chapter to pump out a chapter. It's such a reductive and idiotic mindset that comes off as the author really not caring about the world. Next part. Why do you like Ruby? In all honesty, I am not a fan of the plot or story of Ruby, but find the lore and world to be very interesting. A world in which people have come to terms with being locked in a small territory sounds like Attack on Titan with a strange, hopeful quality to it. I also like the idea of a world so precious that they accept teaching an army of children to fight monsters. The mix of risking one's one's life to fight monsters and going through a stool is about about is interesting me. Dystopian without being grim dark. There's another issue. When most of the time when I see writers write something, they usually write something they like. Coer comes off like he actually never watched the show. And this is another thing that happened in, in Headmaster Arc. The sto- the, that story is very vindictive. Half the time, there's a lot of moments where he's just making fun and and shitting on later seasons of the show. I get it. Post Volume 3 of Ruby is very hit or miss in quality. Mostly miss. But that's no way to dedicate lore, like complete utter portions of your story to constantly poke fun at it because it just it comes off as being petty it comes off like you don't really don't give a shit and it really it's really just a redactive idea of a show because if I want to see if I want to read a story I want to read a story of of a show that Whoever is writing it knows about that show, cares about that show. With this, you don't care about the show. You just care about the concept. That's 
that's not liking the show. That's just liking the concept. And I bet, and you know, we live in a time and age where more or less every idea has been done. So there's like there's next to no originality. It's it's all going to be done by like the execution of your world and execution of the characters, which is why you know Ruby kind of went downhill. They completely kept fumbling the execution of a lot of stuff. You know, but this is uh, one of the big ones. Why do you use John as a protagonist so often? John is a common protagonist in my stories, and some like to believe he's the only reason I, person I can write, which is strange. Perhaps my fingers explode if I write a different character. Ultimately, I like John uh, using John because he fits my needs as a character, i.e. an individual with a motivation, an obstacle, and a conflict that comes from them. Basically, John's whole character... Okay. So this is kind of like Ruby talk. John's whole character in the story is the fact that he's just a no- he's just a normal guy. He doesn't have no practice as a hunter. He doesn't he his family didn't really want him to learn any of the tricks of the trade. And so what he did was he went and filed fal- basically filled out false pa- uh, false certificates to join to be able to join Beacon. Basically, he falsified his record and stuff like that. He's meant to be a more everyday man character, and so his conflict is, you know, learning the tricks of the trade, learning, you know, seeing how the hunt, how a hunter or huntress works from a civilian point of view, and that's fine. The uh, and this kind of comes what I think a big problem with his stories are outside. Of, out of all the stories I've, I've reviewed, outside of Not This Time Fate, and which is a different character, which is a completely different take on John, and Captain Dragon, which has Yang Zhao Long as the main character, all of the Johns and all the other characters are essentially the same guy. Forge Destiny, Knight of Salem, Professor Arc, Headmaster Arc. And um, Beacon Soul War. They're all essentially the same guy. They're, they're essentially the same character. They go through the same character arc. They have the same character growth. They have the same core flaws and strengths. One of the fun aspects that I like to review when it comes to reading fan fiction is seeing characters done in these very, very circumstantial wacky ways and how they fit in the story. With these stor- with these stories, with these specific types of John, it's actually the inverse. So the writing, they're writing essentially the same main character just in different, slightly different scenarios. In slightly different scenarios, and the uh, the author writes the plot in order to essentially have them go through the same character arc. They have the same they have the same beginning point. John is more or less just a clueless idiot who doesn't really who kind of barely knows what he's doing. And the same end point, he becomes like a very uber popular person that everyone loves. And usually ends up with like a harem, sort of, in head of after arc. And he just doesn't want to deal with that. He just wants to goof off and, and everything. And the same journey in between. Yes, in each story, the journey kind of takes different twists and turns. But at its core philosophy, it's more or less the same plot. It's just different contexts. And there's also the idea that, oh, he's only using John because he has, an in, he has an, a motivation, an obstacle, and a conflict that comes from them. Any care That's another thing with fan fiction. I, and this is something I don't like with a lot of fan fiction authors as a whole. Not every, not all of them. But a lot of fan fiction authors have this really... I would honestly say idiotic mindset that the only way to write fan fiction is if all the characters 
are as close to how they acted in canon as possible. I quite frankly think that's a stupid mindset. Because at the end of the day, fan fiction is all about what the you know the fans' interpretations of a character. They can they can you can have such wild and goofy and wacky and dumb and exciting different takes of care of characters like Princess Peach, for example, impaling Saiso Bob with a stick. I'm not telling you where that's from, but if you know, you know. Or, say, let's use another author that ha- has a lot of stories. Starlet Duck. She's written a lot of stories. on Most of them about the Koopalings. Are the Koopalings written in close to their canon personalities in the Mario series? No! They're not. Maybe Wendy. Wendy's probably, pr- probably pushing it. As close as you can, and maybe Iggy, but by and large, they're not—they're not written in their canon personalities, and that's fine because they're not. The whole—the whole aspect of the show is that they're not in—they're not their canon selves. They're completely different versions, but you know that they're still the Koopalings. That's what I'm trying to get at. Having this mindset. That you only use one character is fine. But when you have that same... But when you write that character the same way every single time... It's not even just John. He writes Blake the same way. He writes Neo the same way. Except for not this time fate where Roman dies. And so she kind of turns into a psychopath. Uh, He writes Pierre the same way. He writes Weiss the same way. He writes... Uh, Blake and Raven and Oz, Ozpin's kind of different. A vast majority of the characters in his stories are written the same way. There's a fair, it's very rare that they're going to have a different, that the author puts a different take on the character. So once you see John in, in, in Professor Ark, the vast majority of the stories, he's probably going to be written the same way. Same thing with Ruby. Same thing with Blake. Same thing with Yang. It's all more or less the same. Yes, there's probably going to be diff- there's probably going to be slight, slight differences, but once you get past the nitty gritty and you really focus and pay attention on how their character is and how they progress the story, you realize they're the same characters. The Super Koopa Links have an excuse because they're a uh, a serialized series of stories. So all the stories are connected. They're a basic in essence they're the whole thing is they're supposed to be emulate a Saturday morning cartoon. These these aren't they're their own universes. So why would the author have to write the same group of characters in the same way over and over again. It gets annoying. It gets annoying. So let's move on. Simply put, a good character to me needs some goal they wish to achieve, motivation, and the reason why they cannot achieve this goal, ups goal. Yeah, that can be any character. The whole point a uh, fan fiction is you give any character the motivation and an obstacle. That's storytelling one on one, and you can slot this in any character. From the clash of these, a character gains conflict, and conflict drives the story. John has these because his motivation is to become a huntsman, and his obstacle is that he lacks the skills and forges his way into beacon. Which is true. That's actually in canon. Here's the thing. This kind of goes back to my whole canon thing. He's so obsessed with trying to keep the whole thing as close to canon as possible. And that's another factor of why his stories are so hit or miss. Because he's all of his stories pretty much only take place between volumes one and three. In Profe- Headmaster Arc, I think, is the only story 
that goes past volume three of Ruby in any significant way. Every other story, it's just he somehow ends up with Beacon. He gets he gets wrapped up in the shenanigans with Team Ruby and Juniper. There's all the whole climax of the story is always the Vital Festival. It's always the same. And he goes, Ruby, by comparison, lacks some of this because her dream is to become a huntress and she accepted in Beacon in episode one. Which is a lie. She's accepted into a school to train to become a huntress. She doesn't become a huntress at the beginning. She goes to a school to learn to become a huntress. So he event he actually just admits that he doesn't really know what he's talking about. Obstacle removed and doesn't and Ruby doesn't have any conflict after. She gets a brief one we be over being the leader, but that's thick by again. You can have Ruby you can give Ruby an obstacle and a conflict. So like for example, uh Ruby gains diabetes from eating too many cookies. And now her that's that's her conflict. The fact that she has to lay back on the cookies. Her motivation her motivation is she wants to be she doesn't want to suffer medical and the obstacle is her own addiction to cookies. And it's, it's a stupid it's honestly a stupid example, but it, it's an example. It's an example. There are quite a few Ruby characters who don't have a goal and obstacle. You see that where this not make any sense. And some that quite never gain one. I can make one up for them and have in some cases, Captain Dragon and Stress Relief. But John's problems are quite compelling and fits well as an everyman who lacks a lot of innate advantage and skills the rest of the case. Okay. So basically, he only... So from this last sentence, he only uses John because John is essentially a blank slate. That he can like, oh, I can use him in any situation. I can use him in any situation provided I literally change nothing else about his character. Because it's like, oh, all I have to do is change the, cir the circumstances of what he wants. But ultimately, it just becomes the same character. Over. Tips. Grab the bar back, son. My bad. It becomes the same character. Over. And over. And over. And over. And over and over. And over and over again. There is no difference. <sighs> Why is Blake feature soft? The same reason as above. Blake has a strong motivation and obstacle, and that she wants to escape her life from the White Fang, but White Fang have come to Vale and threaten a new life, and Adam is after her. Here's, here's the thing with, with him writing Blake she's become, in most of her stories, Besides Force Destiny, because that's the world. Blake has become a one-dimensional character who you can sum up as a uh, look, White Fang. Huh? Where? Where? Oh, mm, uh, yeah. That's basically her character in all these stories that she features in. Obsessed with the White Fang to the point of a caricature. That is not compelling writing. That is redactive writing because you're simplifying a character to one trait. And that trait is White Fang. That is not good writing. And also, the fact that you make it the same character, again, brings it down. <sighs> Actually, no. When I talk about uh, final question, so are they your fairy characters? Actually, no. When I talk about characters being useful for literary purposes, that doesn't mean I find them exciting. It just means they are the most useful to me. Any character can be useful. It's just, again, that goes back to the mindset of he's trying to fit how do they work in canon in these certain circumstances. If they don't, well, they don't, I don't care much shit. If they do, okay, they're going to be the main character. It goes back to this, just this very linear-minded mindset of everything has to be as close to canon as possible. Otherwise, it won't make a compelling story. Any, any story can be compelling. From the longest of stories to the shortest stories, as long as you make every single word count. It doesn't. 
and that goes to why I think he is has all so many fans. So I'm gonna go back to Starlight the Baggage. This has to do with length of the story and how many chapters. I have taught I am friends with this author, so so don't so please, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus, Star. But I, I have to at least make mention of your right your your frequency of uploads. Star usually uploads one chapter a day. Now you're thinking, wait, that's horrible. That's kind of going against your your argument, because that's actually gonna be my argument for this. Here's the thing. Star one usually only writes very short stories. So if we go to this story, you know, you can see it's not a long chapter at all. This is basically the entire chapter. One. Two, she edits her, she actually goes back and edits her chapters to make sure one, everything is consistent. Two, the grammar is clean. And three, the characters make sense in the context of the story. So basically, she goes back and proofreads everything. And, and the length. If I remember right, I think this is actually her longest story. Me, I actually double check. Uh, yeah, I think this is... Her longest story is this. Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans Rant. The short... This is her longest. Coer's shortest novel story is 81,000. Most of his stories, on average, are somewhere between 300,000 and 500 and 600,000. And, uh, let's see. Where is Forge Destiny? Where is Forge Destiny? Where is it? And Forge Destiny and the Relic of the Future are his two longest stories. At over a million words each. The reason I have to compare Coer to Star is mostly due to not the frequency of upload. Now, Star, if you actually notice, Star keeps, you know, has, has gets fairly decent views. Ma uh, Mario doesn't get as many reviews as Ruby. Coer has written one chapter every week for 10 years. His first story all the way back in 2014. And he is consistently uploaded pretty long chapters of novel length stories. And that caught and this kind of goes back to the whole YouTube thing. Not, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean much, but I'm bear with me. Sometimes people like retention. So they don't care what the quality of the story is as long as they're constantly updated. Even that comes with a cost. The difference between Coer and Star is Star is mostly writing for fun. Coer is writing to get extra money. So he has every right to constantly be keeping everyone updated. He has a Patreon. Every, like a lot of his... Here, see. If we go down here, he 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 constantly answers questions in the author's notes. He constantly tells you, gives you updates on when he'll next up, well, he'll next update and everything. Everything is scheduled in a way to let people know when they'll be getting an update, and that causes a lot of issues when it comes to retention. So let's actually go for Destiny. 
go back to Forge Destiny. Most people, when they came to review this story, when the story was being worked on, they didn't care about the quality. They cared simply about the fact that he was consistent with his uploads. It's the same thing in YouTube videos. A lot YouTube will like it if a YouTube channel is consistent with their uploads. So that way it gives it gives more attention. People can can pay attention to when the videos come out and so they know when to have a, a long time to watch them. It's retention. Coer is the same way. Except he doesn't have the same quality control of a lot of these a lot of these stories. And over time, if you keep this retention, sooner or later, something is going to give. Even like a channel like SMG4, for example. They have to sometimes take a couple weeks break, not only to rest, so that, so that way they can plan on ideas as, as much as they can in advance. And, you know, have a little, and plan, and, you know, figure things out. Writing a chapter with no quality, quality control. No editing, no proof, proofreading, no sense of inconsistency. Every week, across multiple stories, at its worst, he he was working on nine stories at the same time. Over several years, over the course of a decade, that is going to cause a lot of problems. Star. On the other hand, writes maybe like what like works on like three. I'm guessing three or four stories around the same time, but they're shorter. The more the stories are shorter, the chapters are shorter. She goes back and re and makes sure they're up to snuff. So she and she told me that she tends to take breaks if she needs the time to. Goer doesn't seem the type being the type of guy who doesn't take breaks. So it's it's night and day. Like you have someone who's write, writing these stories to make a profit and to try and be an author, and then you have someone who's just re- who's just writing to have fun. And then you have a lot of these people who tend to be very divisive over his stories because one, there's no quality control, but also the fact that a lot of people just mindlessly praise the story because of that retention. It's like, oh, he's uploading consistently, so therefore I'm going to keep praising him so I can keep get so that way he can keep the retention up. It, it, it's a it's a feedback loop of sorts. However, sometimes you have to you have to learn to take criticism. I don't honestly don't think Color has taken has listened to any valid criticism because while I haven't read a lot of his newer stories I might read. Uh, where was it? Uh, not this. Not this one. Um, self. Yeah, I think self-made man. I might. I might review. Read that. Over the course of all of his stories, he hasn't really improved as an author. He hasn't really grown. He's stagnated. His themes are, his characters are pretty much the same. His stories are pretty much the same, just with very minor differences. At their core, on surface level, there you're going to see a lot of differences. But once you get down to the nitty gritty and you see through all the differences, they're just very samey in terms of present in in terms of like the core concepts. The end points are the same. How they go about them are the same. It's just. And the author has con- convinced himself that quantity automatically equals quality. That he can write a story, a, cha- a chapter a week for a decade straight, automatically makes him the best writer, automatically makes his stories good, automatically thinks that makes him makes him the Ruby author that everyone has to be compared to and not realize that your people only only reading your stories because you're just consistent with your upload schedule that's not that doesn't mean anything it just 
it just means people just write you because most people most fan people who read fan fiction prefer to read complete fan fictions and he's very well known for completing fan fiction i think like this is the only i, I don't I, I i can't even remember what is he all i don't even know i don't even know what i do know is at this point in time he has convinced himself that he is good enough to rewrite Forged Destiny as a legitimately piece of physical novel. Basically, he wants to publish Forged Destiny as its own book. And he's convinced, I'm pretty sure, thanks to his fans. He's convinced that it will sell. No, it won't. Because writing a novel is completely different from writing a fan fiction. Because, one, authors will know you're, being bull you're bullshitting. Because they're very fickle and very technical. You, just, like, you, you think I'm technical? No. Listen to an actual novel, uh, an actual... Uh, liter literature reviewer, they will completely tear the story apart, and all he is gonna, all he's gonna do is just remove all the Ruby stuff and just replace it with his own characters. The story's gonna flop. He's gonna completely, just co completely come to terms with the fact that he's not, he's just nothing. He's just an old, he's just a shell of an author who's only got popular because of his his upload schedule, not because of the quality of the stories. And so when I say Captain Dragon was good, not this time feat. Freaking amazing. Because Beacon Civil War. Hilarious. But you can't you can't it you can't write essentially the same story over and over again without it without diminishing returns. And that's gonna and I think that's what's going to cause Forge, Forge Destiny to fail. Because he's banking on the fact that his fans are probably going to buy it. He's going to bank on that. And he's going to bank on the possibility that, they're, that the more technical, technically aspectual, technically warranted letter like pure novel people are going to look at this story and just tear it to shreds and i don't want that to happen i want i want coer if he ever watches video because i don't know if he's gonna watch this video to realize that you need to step back from from the john from john arc and realize that you are not perfect. That you are just a guy. And don't big yourself up like this. Because it because I think at this point in time, it's just gonna it's just gonna fall apart. You're 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 probably gonna get like a, a really bad confidence issue. And everything is just going to completely turn into a massive clusterfuck of your confidence because now you're going to realize shit my story my story is not selling because also the fact that most of the people here they're just reading fact they're just reading the story because it's it's free just because someone just because you gave me someone something for free doesn't mean they're automatically going to spend like 30 40 bucks tw anywhere from 20 to 40 bucks on a hard copy novel it's just not. I want you to walk out of this. And you can criticize me. If you want to criticize me, go right ahead. I'm not going to force you. But at least take my advice on looking at your stories as a whole. And realizing you're not good enough to write to publish a full-length novel. You're just not. You are an average story 
an, an average author at best who got lucky two or three times, who got lucky at the beginning, and then you rode a surge of popularity without anyone even questioning your your writing process because everyone loved Ruby at the time. Just think about it. Just always listen to to valid criticism. Don't listen to flames. Just listen to yourself. Don't don't put yourself in a. Don't listen to people who are only going to blindly praise you. Like and I want to, and I'm going to ask you, my my viewers, anyone who watches this video, if you think I'm wrong, don't hesitate to leave in the comments. You want to shit talk me? Shit talk me. I won't. I won't mind because. Ultimately, you're going to have to face criticism from no matter what you do. And I think a lot of these problems have stemmed from the fact that Kor hasn't faced criticism. And I want him to, and I think he really does need to face this harsh reality that he doesn't think he, that he's not as good as he thinks he is. I'm sorry, that's just what I think. He just He's not a great author. He's a, he's an average author who got lucky. And that is it. I don't really have anything more to say on this matter. Just reviews don't mean everything, really. So having a bunch of reviews doesn't mean anything. It's just more about the content of the reviews. So just, you know. Um, I think that's it for this video. I wanted, I wanted to rant a little bit. Thank you for listening to me. This has been Dark Symphony 777, and I will see you next time.